Today, hundreds of thousands of people in the United States and abroad are mobilizing to raise their voice and concern over the climate crisis. Phoenix, Arizona, the problem is water, a torrent of rain. Central and eastern parts of Korea. People in northern India and Pakistan floods for decades. Hundreds have died in the disputed Himalayan region of Kashmir. In the Indian-administered zone, the army has been trying the growing movement around climate change is forcing the world to look at solutions to the climate crisis. Across the globe, momentum is building, demanding that we shift towards fostering a more ecological and just society. Scientists have reached consensus that global climate change, not just this progressive warming of the Earth's surface, known as global warming, but the severe disruption of weather patterns, including record-breaking heat waves, long-term drought, 100-year floods and snowfall in consecutive years, and increasingly extreme superstorms are becoming the new normal. Climate change is real, and human activity in the form of greenhouse gas emissions is the root cause. The climate crisis is urgent and dire, but solutions to address it already exist. Small-scale farmers can cool the planet as they feed the world. Climate change can have really huge effects on our future. Sea levels, they're gonna rise dramatically. And if we don't do something right now, it could severely impact civilization as we know it. Around the world, small-scale farmers are bearing the brunt of climate change. But small-scale farmers also offer a powerful solution. We are having climate disasters right now. In my region in the Himalaya last year, a massive flood because of extreme rains uh, washed away 20,000 people. This year, the Kashmir floods have already killed 500. We don't know how many more. All over the world, there is an impact. The People who live on the coastlines are seeing the rising seas are inundating them. In south parts of the country, like Bangladesh, they're flooding in one end of the country. They have a drought on the other end of the country, and the rivers are drying up. There's more desertification in, in various places. There are more massive, huge climatic disasters happening all over the world. It impacts people's livelihoods, their access to food their access to services. In order to understand the benefits of small-scale farming practices, let's look at the devastating effect of the flip side of the coin, industrial agriculture. Direct agricultural activities are responsible for 11% to 15% of greenhouse gas emissions. We've been made to believe that without fossil fuels and external inputs and nitrogen fertilizers and big mechanization and long distance trade in food, there is no way to feed the world. Every one of those assumptions is false. Soil fertilizers don't create fertility, they kill fertility and they, in addition, lead to emissions of nitrogen oxides, they create dead zones. Most of the fertilizers applied are not taken up by plants. Factory farming is the logic of industrialization. The methane coming out from factory farms is a very big problem with greenhouse gases. But in addition, this long distance trade in food is leading to 50% waste of food. Farm-related land clearing and deforestation are responsible for 15 to 18% of greenhouse gas emissions. Food processing, packing and transportation are responsible for 15 to 20 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. Decomposition of food waste is responsible for 3 to 4 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. Local systems, fair systems, ecological systems can undo so much of the damage that this 40 percent can only get worse as industrial agriculture expands through the myth that industrial farming feeds the world and now the latest of industrial farming as GMOs feeds the world. Nothing is further from the truth. We're seeing super weeds. We're seeing infestations of pests in, in, in numbers and magnitudes that have never occurred before. Small farming practices grow 80% of the food consumed in the non-industrialized world. Small farmers, at their best, use practices like agroecology and regenerative organic agriculture. Organic farming is the most effective way to both reduce emissions by stopping the carbon dioxide, the nitrogen oxide and methane, but also absorbing more and adapting better with resilience. We grow more food in the process, our farmers have higher incomes in the process, and as a byproduct, we also solve the biggest problem of our times, climate disasters. 
900 million small farmers are growing the vast majority of food for humans on only a quarter of the land. Small-scale regenerative organic farming uses widely available and inexpensive methods. If we switched all agricultural practices to follow this model, greenhouse gas emissions that propel climate change could be significantly reduced and we could sequester 100% of current carbon dioxide emissions. But to do it, we need to stand with small-scale farmers. Small farmers, for the most part, really are reservoirs for biodiversity. Organic farming and ranching and land use can not only address the global climate crisis, but actually reverse it. If we use the traditional methods of rotational grazing and no-till or conservation tillage organic, you know, if we stop the deforestation and plant more trees, we can literally bring back 100 parts per million of the excess carbon that's in the atmosphere and put it back where it used to be, which is in the soil. Regenerative organic agriculture. Let's use all three of those words together and what really does that mean? They're building the soil so that it is a better place for carbon to be absorbed into. You're leaving behind a better place than you found. It is not just something to hold the plants upright. Our farm this year is better than last year, every year. They understand the cycle of nature far more than industrial monocultures. Healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. It's not real technical, and it's not about a magic bullet. It's probably about something like fifth grade science class. It's so simple. What we found is Mother Nature has provided us with the answer, with the technology, for lack of a better word. And it's really simple. It's green plants and photosynthesis. Green plants take carbon dioxide out of the air, liquefy it, and they actually make simple sugars. They take CO2, water, and sunlight and turn it into simple sugars in a liquid form, from gas to liquid during the photosynthesis process and then they exudate it or exude it into the soil for the microbes that li live around the root base of the plant. When we use cover crops, crop rotations, no-till, and compost, we allow those microorganisms to hold that in their body until the carbon actually becomes part of their molecular structure. And when that happens, that carbon stays in the soil for generations. That is carbon sequestration. The answer, again, is simple. Photosynthesis and good, healthy soil biology. That plant is healthier. Uh, they can weather drought, for example, because organic soil holds moisture like a sponge. In issues of other severe weather conditions, organic crops outperform in yields against the chemical produced. Peasant agriculture can cool the climate, cool the climate and feed the world. Yields are the same or better. We use about 45% less energy because uh, most of the energy that is put into the chemical growing system is petroleum-based pesticides and synthetic fertilizers, which of course we don't use. The false solutions that are presented are only solutions that are made to put some money in some big corporations' pockets. Scientists readily accept that building the soil is the way you change the climate. With photosynthesis, good healthy biology, we can mitigate 100% of current emissions. The beauty of it is now, though, we can actually tip the needle past 100% and begin to draw down excesses. So we're at approximately 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. We want to get back to that balance of about 350 parts. So just mitigating, even at 100%, uh, that's all we're doing is mitigating. Uh, the answers that um, everybody's coming up with on the technical side of things are lowering emissions, um, better gas mileage and so on. We're tipping the needle past 100%. The answer is really what has been part of the problem, and it's agriculture. Regenerative organic agriculture is not the problem, it's the answer.
Small-scale farmers feed the majority of the world with access to less than a quarter of all farmland. Small-scale integrated organic farms are more resilient in the face of intensifying climate change events like hurricanes than plantations and monocultures. Regenerative organic farming can sequester more than 100% of current annual carbon dioxide emissions by converting to widely available and inexpensive organic management practices. The United Nations Special Repertoire on the Right of Food estimates that small farms produce up to 80% of the food in the non-industrialized world. Generally, small farms around the world are farmer-owned. Their families supply most of the labor and rely on farm earnings as a significant part of their income. However, many small farmers are also often landless and rely on contract labor and off-farm income for their survival. The majority of farms in the Global South are no bigger than five football fields. Across the globe, most small farmers lack access to both domestic and international markets, sufficient credit lines and infrastructure, and are especially vulnerable to loss of land and unstable markets that systematically take advantage of and contribute to the precarious state of small farming. If we want to be able to employ this regenerative organic agricultural model, we need people to do it. And it's not going to be, you know, sort of the, the masters of industry, but it's actually going to be farmers with the traditional knowledge and the land that are actually feeding people to do it. Small-scale producers are critical if we are going to confront and address climate change. Right now, small farmers across the planet are in danger. Little by little, they're being driven from their land, undermined in the marketplace, and marginalized in the political arena. And in the process, we're not only losing the biodiversity, the local, safe, and healthy food, we're also losing the traditional knowledge that we will need to move forward. Farmers must be listened. They have a lot of solutions, proposals, and even fears to express uh, at the national, but also at the international level. One thing that's particularly critical is fair trade. Fair trade is a, a way of direct trading relationships between conscious and solidarity consumers in the global north and producers in the global south. What fair trade can do, in fact, through fair prices and fair trade premiums, stable markets, and long-term direct trading relationships is provide an opportunity for farmers to stay on the land while develop their farm economies so that they can feed their families and communities, as well as produce for export. In some cases, fair trade projects have included compost operations, reforestation and water projects, technical assistance, and energy efficient technology, not only shoring up the local food economy, but also combating climate change. The fair trade links allow those who eat to recognize what went into food, to give respect to the soil, the seed as well as the farmer who produced the food. They still have indigenous uh, knowledge and agricultural practices that could better afford these impacts of climate change. They have native seeds that are in better condition to uh, higher temperatures or more levels of humidity. Dar el producto a buen precio, porque aquí hay orgánico y convencional. El ajolí convencional tiene un precio muy barato y el ajolí orgánico tiene un precio justo. Ecological agriculture produces more food and more nourishment per acre and is the best way to solve the problem of poverty and most importantly, it's the most effective way to deal with climate change. Since June 2014 to December 31st, we've harvested over 12,000 pounds of organic produce and try to distribute it to people who normally don't have access to healthy food. Part of what our goal is, is to empower people in the community to be able to grow their own food uh, within the urban setting, whether it's on their back porch or their windowsill or their front or backyard or the corner empty lot. Too much of the movement to deal with climate change is based on fear. It now needs to move to cultivating hope. And that's why one big part of Navdanya is cultivating gardens of hope. And a garden could be a pot in your balcony. The garden doesn't have to be a giant 100,000 square mile industrial farm. It's about life. Get more interested in organic food, in local production. Our ultimate goal is healthy people. Good, healthy, vibrant soil makes good, healthy, vibrant food, and we want that to reflect globally into healthy humans.
small farmers and conscious consumers can cool the planet. 70% of all farm animals in the world are in these CAFOs or confined animal feeding operations. We have to put an end to this. What consumers can do uh, is boycott all factory farm foods, period. And, uh, you know, we need to start that today, not tomorrow. Eat organic food. Grow your own organic food. Be involved. You have to be an activist at some level, whether it's buying organic, whether it's growing your own garden, whether it's, it's riding your bicycle instead of driving. Everything that we do makes a difference. As we move forward with this quest to reverse climate change, it's really about generations to come. It's about our children and our grandchildren. And when they look back on us, what is the legacy that we left behind? What gives me hope is sowing a seed into fertile soil. Soil that has been made fertile by giving back to the earth what she gave to us, and that's organic farming. Climate change is the biggest challenge of our generation. Small farmers practicing regenerative organic agriculture or agroecological practices can greatly reduce global greenhouse gas emissions and even sequester significant amounts of carbon while feeding our communities, strengthening our economy, and preserving our environment. Change your habits. Compost. Grow your own food. Join a community garden. Boycott factory farmed foods. Buy products made by dedicated fair trade brands who are building direct relationships with small scale fair trade farmers. Engage policymakers and fight for policy change. Taking personal action is important, but critically, we need to transform the political system by engaging decision makers and advocating for policy changes that safeguard and support small scale farmers while promoting regenerative organic agroecological practices and regulating polluting industrial agriculture. Through personal action, conscious consumption, and policy change, we can create the shift needed to make a real impact. Confronting climate change is not only possible, but an opportunity to transform the world. It only takes one match to light the fuse. It only takes one match to light the fuse. action and get involved, visit fairworldproject.org.